Welcome to the Capital Club. It's a privilege and an honor to be welcoming you to this discussion with some of the brightest minds Check. in entertainment and business. Hosted by the Future Blockchain Summit and Jitex, I'm Oscar Wendell with MCH Global. I'll give you an idea who we have in the room with us here today. Fernando is the Grammy Award winning producer of Lady Gaga's first two albums. This worked with practically every artist that you ever heard of in the last 20 years. Now that may sound unbelievable because he looks so young. He's but only 12. He's only 12. <laughs> but he's in the room. <laughs> Dr. Marwan is a very close friend of mine. For many years, he founded the Future Blockchain Summit back in 2018. And I've been looking after that conference since 2019. Ahmed bin Sulaim has done so much for this country and the, com the companies that he represents and that he has brought into the UAE surpasses what many nations in GDP. <clears throat> what, well, how, many countries do you, how many companies do you have at DMCC today? Over 23,000. Um, <clears throat> We have more than 40% of the UK business. We have more than 40% of the UK businesses that are in the UAE, which is 5,000. We have over 2,000 in, in DMCC. Um, we represent probably the largest concentration of oil and gas and renewable energy companies in one um, uh, free zone, which is over 3,070 companies, and about between 60 to 70 percent of the blockchain crypto companies within the GCC are based out of DMCC Crypto Center, which includes Solana. Bybit and Binance Technologies, me and at DMCC. Try to put your head around 23,000 companies. It's unbelievable. And before I go on to introduce OG Arabian Prince, what is so astonishing with DMCC, it stands for Dubai Multi Commodity Center. It is the center for commodities trading gold, diamonds, coffee, grains. And this man has the vision to bring in blockchain and crypto to Dubai, and it has totally changed the dynamics of this region. And everyone is following now the lead of Ahmed bin Sulaim. OG Arabian Prince, he is the founding member of NWA and the co-producer of the album Straight Outta Compton together with Dr. Dre. If it hadn't been for this man, we would not have gangster rap as we know it today. In fact, if Straight Outta Compton came out today, nearly 30 years, is it 30 years ago now? Yeah. If it came out today, I'd be in prison. It, it would. <laughs> you know, it would still sound as fresh as it did 30 years ago. I mean, it, it didn't just coin and invent gangster rap. It is the, the, the mold that, we, as we know today, what is gangster rap. And, I just want to tell you how magical this moment is to be bringing together Fernando, Dr. Marwan, Ahmed, and OG Arabian Prince. We met Ahmed two days ago. DMCC has been the main partner of the Future Blockchain Summit for the last two years, but I met Ahmed for the first time face to face two nights ago, introducing him to OG Arabian Prince, and I was so happy to see that you're, you're a fan of his. Well, well I, I, when, he said, when he said co-founder of NWA, I thought it was some catchy thing, crypto-related, you know, <laughs> NF something, <laughs> NFT. And I laughed. I said, what, NWA, the hip-hop? Yes. No. He goes, yes. And he shows me, that's me on the picture. So, you know, I didn't let, them, let him go. I'm like, you're doing a tour after this. And as we walked, I played the music. Well, next time, I'm like, I have to. I mean, I still don't believe I'm sitting next to you, bro. <laughs> Neither do I. But we have something in common that most people don't know, and that's Kobe Bryant. Yes. Yes. So yeah. this is my man right here. <clears throat> so two nights ago, we meet up, and uh, I invite you for this evening. And as we're heading out from the hotel, we run into Dr. Marwan, <laughs> my, my closest confidant and partner in blockchain here in Dubai. We speak almost weekly. And this man is so busy and so important that I hadn't even mentioned this evening to Dr. Marwan. And I say, we're heading to the Capitol Club. And he says, 
I'm coming along. <laughs> so this wasn't even planned. So this is a truly, truly destiny to be coming to having this discussion here tonight. And I want to start this uh, conversation by hearing from Fernando and OG Arabian Prince about a little bit about your careers and then talking about how creativity is such a catalyst for business because both you, Dr. Mawan and Ahmed, you're such creative people in seeing opportunity and, and <clears throat> bringing the components together in making new things happen and bringing innovation to this country. If you look at Dunbar's equation, we can see a very simple uh, connection between art and our relationship and who we are. It takes 60 hours to make a decent friendship. It takes 120 hours to make a good friendship. How many hours do you watch basketball? I th I, I, <clears throat> I'll tell you what. Um, before joining DMCC, when I'm supposed to be studying in the U.S., I used to watch all the games. I just loved it, the competition, all of that. And... Um, I think I st really started paying attention to the Lakers when Phil Jackson f took, took the coaching, and I'm like, I think it's going to happen. I was so fixated on seeing Kobe and Lakers uh, get over the hump because they were erratic in the mid-late 90s, so much so that I did see him my first time. I told him that story in 2013 when he set up his company in DMCC. Um, I saw him at Venice Beach at the uh, Gold's Gym. And a friend of mine in Arabic tells me, Ahmed, let's take a photo. I'm like, leave him alone. This might be the year. And it was the year. It was 2000. Uh, but I like their work ethics. I like that he goes to work a few hours before. His mind doesn't stop. Makes me feel normal. I struggled in school. You know, I, uh, I barely finished. But, and I had a chance in DMCC. And it started slow. It was tough. But every opportunity that comes... I don't think that I've been in DMC for 23 years, uh, 22 years or so, but I look at it as this, is, th this opportunity won't come again. And there is influence from Jordan as well. As Phil Jackson will put it, every time he gets to the, <clears throat> plays a game, there's always something he wants to prove, whatever it is, playing through the flu, um, focusing on his defense, etc. And you would see that with Kobe, whether he's injured, he changes his play. That actually helped me in my work as well, regardless of how bad things are. It's not enough for me to give up. I'm still breathing. I'll still push through it. We've, we, the toughest year were the first few years, and then there was also a test during the global recession. And I think Marwan remembers this. We just moved to the Diamond Tower. And to be honest, I was thinking on, of moving on to another business because you know we've delivered the building. We've taken a huge risk uh, by building this uh, tower. And the escrow system wasn't in place. Freehold for offices wasn't really something banks liked. We, we got lucky that Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank financed a lot of the uh, purchases that uh, falls under the ownership of corporation. Um, but we had to put in the contract, if we do not provide the said unit on time, you get a full refund. That was the risk on me. So by the time I moved in, I didn't want to do any more of that. Global recession kicks in. My mind was already shifting to another organization. So I said, I'll restructure. I'll do the changes that DMCC needs to and see what happens. At least my conscience is clear. And we were barely 1,000 companies in 2008. But from the global recession till now, on average, over 2,000 companies every single year. So, and we're still going. The momentum is going. So there's a bit of attracting businesses and developing uh, office buildings and space for them. You must have had a challenge. I mean, you had multiple challenges, but from I asked around about your history, and what I hear is you were um, not risk adverse, right? No. And, and so, but that's, but that's if you I'm see in, in the West, when, in Silicon Valley, that's yeah. celebrated, right? Not here. Yeah. I was seen as reckless. Reckless, right? Um, also, I think I was allowed to move with DMCC and engage, et cetera, because nobody wanted to touch a commodities initiative in the UAE. There were talks within the Arab world, but nothing follows through. Um, but look, I connected with the diamond industry, the Indian community, the Lebanese community, the Belgian community, the Jewish community, US, you name it, and the African community. And I stayed in touch with them. Some of the contacts uh, I have in the, in the jewelry and diamond and gold business are from 23 years ago, 20 years ago. 
I'm dealing now with their kids. And I think there's a case where the grandkids now, I'm seeing them in the business. And, and by the time I see the fourth generation, I'm going to take a sabbatical because it's hitting me now. That's exactly, that's the impact you want. That's legacy impact. Mm -hmm. And that is the true. So that should be celebrated, but it's not. I think the knowledge transfer is where we have a rub, right? If, if you were able to showcase how much creative destruction it takes, and we talked about this, how you're raising your children. Mm -hmm. It's creative destruction. That's how you get to innovation. That's one of the key points. And that's what we realized, and that's what we should share. We'll get back to knowledge transfer. That's right, and that's what you're doing. So you're the first, from my understanding, you're the first um, uh, building that has AI, and, and as, uh, developing AI companies? The Uptown Tower, we used two robots, Lucy and Sarah, some, something with the elevators that it's easier for them to reach than using uh, you know, the workers. But um, on the AI, we put out a teaser, DMCC AI Center, to come, coming soon. And I think we have, I think we have, we have one project we're working on. We're not disclosing it. And today, I actually wanted to call it DMCC AI and Robot uh, Center. My team convinced me not to, because the AI is a whole big world. Fine, but I said we still target robots, and we have 12 companies. And if the guys from LA I met today registered, there'll be 13 companies just in the robotics. I, I have that, one for you as well, so 15. okay, so 14. <laughs> uh, but but you know we we also we, we also experimented. I mean, there's a there's a coffee place at Almasta or Common Grounds, uh, and they had for a short time an AI barista that would just you pick whatever and they'll, they'll make it for you. That robot or AI slash robot got fired. Doesn't have an HR representative or union, <laughs> but it was cool to see that. Uh, also, the reason we were successful with our coffee center. I mean, we've we started early on with the tea center for blending, packaging, and all that. And because of the t success of the tea center, I couldn't ignore the opportunity in the coffee business. And I've just I got inspired by a few of the businesses in Dubai: Raw Coffee, Espresso Lab. And then Liwa Cafe set up in DMCC at, uh, at one point, and it's just a uh, family from Al Ain partnered with Eli. And you go in, it's like Eli threw up in the place. The black and white photos, it's just history about Eli. It's like an Eli museum. The other half was an Eli Barista Institute. I couldn't unsee that. I, I thought to myself, I have the government backing, backing, so why can't I do this? But we're busy with so many stuff that we need to see through. We can't do all the great ideas overnight. And the time came, uh, 2015 or 16, and uh, it was along the time where my uh, uh, friend James Bernard dragged me to join the Blockchain Council. And my words to him was, I don't care, I don't want to be dragged into this, I, I'm, I'm busy with the Kimberly process, diamonds and all that. But he pleaded with me just to sit through that meeting. Um, it resonated with me, the messaging from Noah Rafford saying that, you know, just like the internet, Nobody was using it, and now you can't live without the internet and all that. Fine, we kept it open, and we took baby steps in that. But at the same time, I pushed Price Waterhouse Cooper to focus, to skip all the stages of which commodity for us to focus on and just go with coffee. Coffee wasn't even in their top 10. They had an algorithm based on the customs at chess code, and they wanted to divert key commodities. Number one on the list was meat, which I agree. There is a meat center coming in the near future. But I wanted to, tell, to do the more challenging project in time for when Dubai will be a coffee, uh, will have a big coffee culture. I saw that coming. And I didn't know whether we'd be roasting. Um, I didn't know what aspect of the coffee center we'd be providing, but we had to start somewhere. Um, they were hesitant, PricewaterhouseCooper. They didn't want us to build a big facility. They didn't even want us to jump into Latin American coffee. They used to say, it's a logistic disadvantage. Focus on East Africa, the immediate region, etc. Um, I was traveling, and thankfully my team um, didn't take that uh, as a fact. They just rented the warehouse, borrowed some machinery, and had a shipment from New York and Sao Paulo to come in. Processed the coffees, roasted, shipped it out, no effect on the price. So either they, it was exaggerated, or they were misinformed, or maybe they're trying to protect some market, I don't know. But we went with it, and we're looking to double the size of our facility today. It's a 14,000 square meter temperature control storage facility. We have a five kilo roaster for the micro lots, or the testing, if you will, 30 kilos, 60 kilos. We're contemplating when to bring the 300 kilo roaster. We're using Brambati machines for roasting and the de-stoning cleaning of the 
green coffees, which can do six tons of green coffee per hour. And you can, it's, you can from the offloading of the green coffees, till it's roasted and packaged, no human interaction, and we can apply, and this is the most important part of the coffee center, we can apply anyone's roast profile. We're creating new roast profiles. You remind me of like 500 startups. You have like taking a risk, you're taking the risk, right? And then that allows this removal of the barrier to entry so people can actually have a shot at development. And, and AI is really critical in this point because if you want to fast track the uh, entrepreneurial process that the US have, has have done really well, um, and one do it in a certain amount of time, we don't have the time to do that. So AI will give us that, that proximity and make that proximity shorter, right? And that's the hope, and that's what we hope we're all here together to discuss, is how creativity can advent that, how this creative destruction of breaking with the traditional mold become creative in taking advantage of uh, this, this process and implementing it here, but you're taking the brunt of the risk here. So how do you scale that risk? Well, it's... I think it has to do a little bit with my reality. I joined DMCC for work experience, 10 to 30, 20 months. So I've been on the bonus since, pretty much since I moved into the Diamond Tower. So it's not like I'm being reckless, but there's a bit of, and you know, I've had, I've had some challenging situations in my personal life. So I don't feel the threats, the concerns. You know, I, I don't mind making a mistake. That sounds like resilience to me. That sounds like, you know, that, you know, what you've been through, the, the brutal trauma that allows that thicker skin to be developed so you can move forward without, and who hasn't had that risk uh, or that trauma have had. You want to talk a little bit about how trauma is synthesized into growth? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, with NWA, we went through so many hurdles, like with the police, with the FBI, with um, gangs or just crazy people in the city that thought, that we were a threat to them. Our manager ripping us off early in our career, which that was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Having somebody take your money as a kid, that you know you earned this, you sold a million records and you're not getting paid for it, you never let that happen exactly. again, ever. And yeah. the first thing, you know, the <laughs> business, you learn business really, really well and that helps you flourish. So, you know, that's amazing. Then you get hungry and you find that success is it's definitely um, something that feeds you because you have one success and you want another. You may not succeed every single time, but you know something that my father taught me. My father wrote over a hundred books, right? Um, yeah, he wrote over a hundred books. He was the editor of multiple magazines and newspapers and very pro prolific. And he just told me, he's like, like I want to do this, but I said, just do it. That's all he would tell me. That's, that's the only advice he ever gave me is just do it. Like, wow. when somebody told me, no, do it. And that's all I do now is, like, whatever pops in my head, I just do it. And when someone asked me, like, there's a hunger here because five or six people came to me at Jitex. I'm a singer. I'm a producer. I'm a this. How can I do that? Because I'm here, and I don't have the resources here. I don't have help. What do I do? I'm like, do it. <laughs> just do it. You came up to me. Here's my, here's my, it locked me in. I saw dance music as dangerous, right? Just like you saw your music, hey, like, we have to be dangerous to defend ourselves. And that's what I saw in growing up with gangsters, um, that, you know, the most sensitive music is what the most dangerous men in the world want to hear. Because part of that relationship is that where I grew up is, mach you have to be machismo. And I wasn't. Right? And, but it was these artists that said that, you know, being strong is being vulnerable. And being strong that, is being vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, being strong is being vulnerable. And because when you're vulnerable, you have to let go of all the facades, all the shields, right? And be like an open wound. Oh, you can only be vulnerable when you're strong. And the, yeah, that's exactly it. So it was a misunderstanding. So breaking that norm was what these artists taught us. And then lo and behold, 20 years after doing this, that most of our artists wanted to kill themselves every time they come to the studio, right? And it's not because they were coming to the studio, but they were reminded they had to relive their childhood again because that's not how they create. And so you do this over and over and you create this antiquated model of creativity, right? What creativity is, is the brain's ability to create, essentially. 
But it requires discipline, right? Because we all have ADHD. I recognize it across this place, right? <laughs> and the discipline is that creativity is a built, it's a feature, not a fault, right? We all have it. It's just some of us have it more than others, right? Um, so it's a, misunderstanding by, it's a misunderstanding from society. And we discover this. And we now leverage and celebrate ADHD and these neural diversities as catalysts for creativity. You should be celebrated for taking that risk and being doing so many things at once because you place big bets and you place wide bets, but you also place intelligent bets. Because even Elon Musk has failed, I think, more than anyone else on this planet. But you know, we do recognize his successes, and those successes are massive. But then again, pushing through failure takes resilience, and that takes discipline. It takes faith. 100%. I totally agree with that. And I think the more you are resisted, the more fuel you get for doing even more. Yeah, it's a, it's a cylindrical, it's a flywheel effect, right? One thing fits the other. Want to share your vision on that? Um, <clears throat> first few years, we were looking at what kind of a building we'd be putting for the diamond uh, tower, gold and silver. They, were, they all had the same height. Then we put, I think, the government, they looked at having the Almas Tower in the middle. It was supposed to be a 40-story building, half of which is the hotel. If you visited the Almas Tower, you'll notice there are two floors of retail, there's a gym, there's a conference room, and that's because of the hotel part of it. I had an issue with the hotel being on the top. Now, the Uptown Tower is a mixed-use building, and the, uh, the uh, architecture of a design and technology has advanced where you can get away with a mixed tower and still have good space in the offices. But at that time, this worried me, having the hotel on top, you know, the extra, the service elevators, the, um, you know, it's just going to leave nothing for our main focus, the offices, the businesses. So it was just a humble request. I asked for uh, the management to see if we could have the hotel at the bottom and the offices on the top. That was it, nothing more. And they were adamant, no, it should be on the top for the view. And I could notice they didn't care about the office that much. It felt like some didn't believe it would get there. It's just doing a job, we'll see what happens. The more I looked into it, the more problematic is it. Different access for the hotel, there's a bit of a security matter in my opinion, especially for the jewelers and all that. So I came back to the management and I said, the hotel is not on the top, it's not on the bottom. So where is it? I said, it's not there. So you're going for 20 floors, Ahmed. And I said, 40, maybe 50. And my, my senior manager at the time, my CEO went, we're going to end up with an empty office building. We're going to have so much empty space. You see, they were happy to make, and even experts from New York, as Eliezikov, the former president of the World Diamond Council, used to tell me, why don't you make the mistake of making it too small so it sells out faster? You see, it's more about the headlines, not the real uh, task here. In any case, my response to the comment that we're going to end up with empty office space was, fire me if it doesn't work. <laughs> And I didn't know if it would work. It was just worth the risk. That's what, what was going on in my head. Um, and we saw some interest, but we were barely 400 companies when we, we, uh, we were kind of getting close to the launch. And I didn't like what, was I, what, I, what I was seeing in Dubai um, for the other property projects where you had speculators flipping the contract so many times. You know the end user that is going to move into the house is going to be paying super premiums, and they don't get a chance. So I didn't want any of those people. We took Nakhil's uh, Oracle system, tailor-made it to our needs, and I was in touch with Munir Haider. He was the technical chair of Nakhil. Nakhil was only focused on the procurement side. We didn't have a property team. We have a big property team today. Um, and I kept adding floors. Um, and I said, I think I could, we can do more. And Munir is like, you sure? Because now we have to do basement five, Ahmed. Yes, okay, basement five. I reached level 63, and it wasn't the height limit. It was, I couldn't go to basement six, because if I did six, it would cost me five, four, and three put together due to the dewatering. So I stopped at five. And besides, from 61 onwards, it's one oval, the diamond tower. I'll give you guys the tour soon. And... Um, I was a different person at the time. I wanted the spiral as well on the top, the mast, to, to have a mast tower in the top 20 highest towers. I think it made 13 com tallest commercial tower with a lot of other towers uh, matching it, I guess. Um, anyways, 
launch date comes in, the plan was as follows. Three days for registered companies, and then three days for potential commodities and diamonds companies. So they set up their company and then they buy the office. And then three days, we leave it open to the market. Or, you know, we'll call the speculators, show us how it's done. But I wanted to do right by our members. Um, it was sold out to end users between seven and eight hours. And that had a big ripple effect here. And that was a big shocker to some of the folks in Belgium as well, because most of the big players had a position here. It was called an Indian story for a while, but now you got all kinds of people, like owners of the business from Africa and other parts of the world. And finally, above 63, there's kind of a mezzanine floor, which Dubai Eye Radio loved, took that space, and they're using their old Emirates Tower space as a backup to the radio station. And that mast, that's 4 million dirhams or so, they use that for their antenna, and it's a perfect bandwidth. They cover half of Abu Dhabi and most of Dubai. And just one thing I keep hearing when you speak, it's uh, vision, right? Vision and risk. Well, uh, yeah, and the risk is... Hope. Yeah, risk, yeah, that's really good. And, and um, vision is cloudy, right? Vision is not clear. People think that it's like sometimes very, like, I see exactly. It's not, it evolves over time. I, I have a friend of mine, Robert Bush. He's... Uh, He's African-American. He worked with David Jackson and Nistat Mar. And we meet up every now and then. He set up Dikembe Mutombo's coffee, Mutombo Coffee. And I met, I met Mutombo separately in Miami before he got sick. She met him as well. Um, in any case, when I talk about it, he, he helped us with the diamond, gold, and silver tower, Robert Bush and David Jackson. We put together the financial tools to fund the towers. We weren't given a funding from the government. Most of the plots were already sold in JLT. It wasn't like we had an easy ride. So we raised $200 million gold sukuk, Sharia compliant, put together by London, uh, Standard Bank London, Dubai Islamic Bank, and Istithmar. It got an A stable rating by SMP. And uh, the big chunk of it was taken up by the Malaysian market. They love Sharia compliant products. And uh, had we not taken the risk of bringing the first gold bond, we were, we were actually the second government entity to get a uh, rating by SMP after Abu Dhabi. In any case, the rest is history. But when Robert Bush looks back, this is how he described it. You know, it worked because, Ahmed, you drank the Kool-Aid. There you go. <laughs> That's what he said. You drank the Kool-Aid. You, you just kept at it. So I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I look back. There are risks I wouldn't take today. But I'm, you know, I'm the 20-year-old, 24-year-old, 30-year-old person. It's different. And I do take risks today, but it's different. I don't think it's the same because we earned the trust. We earned the trust because after that, we financed a G plus 14 building, uh, one JLT with the columns with the glass. So you have uh, columnless floor, office floors and uh, about 20, 21,000 square feet each floor. For the, uh, and we didn't need to raise any fund for that. The banks know us. They see our cash flow from our services and registrations. Uptown Tower, we tied that up with Dubai Islamic Bank. Obviously, they can't finance a, a, a hotel with alcohol and all that, but they just finance the construction. And we're ahead of schedule. What are your thoughts, uh, Ahmed, on, on the, 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 the f traditional model of bringing Mc uh, you know, Bain, McKinsey, et cetera, to solve these big problems, and then actually maybe flipping the model and uh, looking at uh, independent actors, such as like our institute, et cetera, to stimulate uh, new and catalyze creativity, perhaps, and these knowledge transfers. It sounds interesting uh, as a, a potential opportunity. Well, we've, we've assigned a consultant to expand on our tea and coffee center. So what's missing in our tea center? We, we do not handle the herbal and medicinal teas yet. Um, we could do more on the coffee side, but there's so much that we could do. We already, and my team doesn't like me mentioning this, but we do the universal Nespresso capsules. I don't know why they think they could hide it for whatever reason. I think they want the big players not to catch up on it, but whatever. There's a lot more we're gonna do with that. And also um, the, the the success of the coffee center has put my eyes on the cacao center, but I'm being very careful with that. Honey, the honey industry has a challenge. There's, it's not really regulated, and there's a lot of fake Yemeni honey, fake this honey, and technology has caught on where you could figure these things out, and I'm carefully approaching that. I wanted to start with the meat, cacao, and honey, but 
sometimes opportunities pop up, even though you're not planning to jump on it, you go for it. So the water center is something I jumped onto. White labeling, we, ha we tied up freshwater Norway. They have a mandate to supply 50 billion liters of water in the next 50 years. We're looking to monetize water. There might be a water coin coming. Um, we're getting close. We'll see how that goes. More than ha happy to help with that as well. Okay, I'm glad to hear that, man. Um, it's, uh, we're working with uh, Yaakov Shirazi, um, chairman and founder of Aqua Index. He tried to do it in the U.S. It didn't work with Nasdaq. There were some lobbies against it. But his, like when I heard his presentation and his pitch to me, I f the first thought came to my mind: this is controversial. You're monetizing water, which should be, you know, free, etc. But he says that's the real problem. The idea that it's just free and taken for granted is why it's polluted, it's wasted, and all that. But once it's monetized and it becomes like uh, like a major commodity as soybean, fuel oil, gold, silver, uh, diamonds, you're gonna have around the reservoirs, river, the same security that you have around gold. That's and interesting. That is really interesting because that's what happened to music, right? It became valued at zero. Right, and so when you train um, and educate um, uh, people to respect the value of something that's very, very valuable, and re-educate them on how to value that, that changes the relationship. The, well, the, the signature is excellence here, um, and that's where we get across every, all the projects here that we notice, and, and we really appreciate. Uh, is there's a high bar of excellence, and 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 a very extraordinary pace of execution. Right, it's really, really. Um, you see a building go up, like you're here a year later, and you. New buildings have shown up. It's like, how does this happen? Um, uh, um, Arabian Prince, you've now been here how many times? Uh, well, I've been here probably 10 or 11 times, but Guy Tech's, what, twice, three times, something like that? Yeah. And, and how, I, I know there's an appetite now more than ever. What, what tipped you over to wanting to get involved in Dubai more than, than before? The hunger, you know, <laughs> the growth, those two things, hunger and growth. Because everywhere else, people, become complacent, right? Especially when you have all the tools at your disposal and you got 100,000 or a million people just in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles or in the US, everybody's trying to be a star. So how is it special? It's not special. But when I went to Riyadh, when I went to Abu Dhabi, when I went to Jeddah, when I came here, it's special. There's a hunger because not many people have reached that goal in the region to be, and it, it's not about being a celebrity or star, it's about being successful. And I'll, you know, when I, I speak to kids, when I teach it, the um, music business thing, I ask one, well, I ask this question, I go, who here wants to be a star or famous? Some people raise their hands, but some people are recluses they don't really want. Who here wants to be successful? Everybody raises their hand, right? And I think that's the key is finding a place where people want to be successful and they have the hunger for that. And like you say, the knowledge transfer, bringing the tools, bringing that information to fast track that and build, you know, I'm about building new things. I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed Willy Wonka. I want to create and make new things. That's what drives me to be a success is watching other people grow. I want to add something very important to that. I think the only person that can be successful is the person that is happy for the success of others. And Dubai is very unique in that it wants to see everybody succeed. And there is no jealousy when you see people succeed. It's so easy to put together Jitex because everybody has this enthusiasm to <clears throat> see Dubai succeed and, and bring together optimistic and strong people that have a vision. You don't have that in other cultures, and I don't want to point fingers here, but it truly is a culture that is open and tolerant and sees the best in all people. I, I have an example from the leadership. Um, I think it was barely a year after the tsunami hit and Japan was, you know, uh, going through a lot of challenges and it's barely standing up and all that. And during, uh, you know, I saw something from Sheikh Hamad Rashid, uh, the vice president and prime minister of UAE and ruler of Dubai, during the uh, World Cup, the horse race. Now, he's competitive, as you know, 
he changed the face of the uh, horse race industry. But that night, the number, the, the winner was a Japanese-owned horse. And he jumped and celebrated more than I've ever seen him when he won his own uh, races. So he was happy to see that. He loved that success story, you know, coming out of it and all that. So I, I see that. And also on, on the knowledge thing, knowledge base, I've, see, I've seen DMCC put together knowledge series, updating members, getting feedback from them, inviting others. We do have luncheons, a UK lunch, Australia lunch, and, you know, just to get the feel, understand where the government's coming up community, etc. But there was one project about seven years ago, give or take, <clears throat> they presented it to me, and I didn't think it would work, which is the Future of Trade, Future of Trade Workshop, where for a year, we go around the world, key markets around the world, and we alternate. You know, right before the global pandemic, I went to San Francisco and Houston, met with the Silicon Valley people, the oil and gas, and some of the players in, in Houston as well. And we talk about current challenges and opportunities. But before that, I misunderstood it. I felt like, why would, in a, in a discussion, Coca-Cola help Pepsi-Cola, et cetera, I thought the competitive aspect of it wouldn't work. I was completely wrong. Um, we have the report coming every two years. And the last report that came up uh, was downloaded more than 1.8 million times. Now, the difference between our uh, Future of Trade report that focuses on the industries we've come up with, the gaming, a crypto edition, a gaming uh, edition, and the, and the most recent, the lab-grown diamond edition, and now the energy one, which is coming next week. Um, <clears throat> I believe there's an unbiased approach to it. It's not too BRICS supporting or not too West supporting. We just put up the information, and you do what you will with it. And, I, and that in itself started attracting more businesses towards us for some reason. That's stimulating new economics and new opportunities. Uh, and so that's an ecosystem build, right? So that's systems level innovation. That's, that's the, the one that wins. That's why Elon gave away his patents, right? He wanted to stimulate. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to um, mention the gaming and esports. That is something that you've launched this year, and I was very glad I to. I it last year. I'll, yeah. I'll share the story in a second. Yeah, like this year at uh, Jai Takes and Future Blockchain Summit, it's, be it's, it's because of our close collaboration that we had the first day at Future Blockchain Summit being the eSports theme day together mm. with uh, CNBC Arabia's Game Changers. And um, <clears throat> Dr. Marwan, he is a driving force of eSports as well. He he's a driving force of everything. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. And who would guess that OG Arabian Prince has developed about 200 games since uh, 40 years. 42 years in the game. Yeah, I didn't four, see that coming. 42 out. years in gaming. Like, I'm meeting the founder. <laughs> and he's like, I've been doing games for 42 years. I'm, I'm a like, nerd. Whoa. I'm a nerd. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think like this, this, you know, it hasn't even been a week, but it feels like it's been a long time. But uh, I feel there's so much opportunity with gaming, and it unites a lot of innovation, entertainment. And uh, I, I, I guess I'd like to conclude with uh, t talking a little bit about that and uh, what you see in terms of um, gaming and esports. Um, if, if, you, if you remember when the announcements came up, it was announcing five months later after the company was registered in DMCC that Binance Technology, Technologies mean at DMCC is, pick, is the newest addition to our at the time, 400 crypto plus companies. I, I put out the announcement. My marketing team, for some reason, thought it wasn't newsworthy, but never mind that. <laughs> um, the next one was uh, the water center to be coming soon, same way the teaser we put out for the AI center recently. And then I put up the gaming because, uh, you know, you talk about uh, taking motivation from criticism or, or, or some disparaging comments. And one that kind of bothered me a little bit where there was, and I knew where it was coming from. We were growing phenomenally fast, and we still are on the crypto side of the business. And I guess within the region, there are some who are struggling to attract the business. So I'm assuming their management, the consultants are costing more money than what's coming in. So the comment was, why is DMCC looking at crypto? Shouldn't they just focus on commodities? And it's just very ignorant. So my reaction was announcing Binance, and a few days later, there's a picture of me and CZ in Abu Dhabi, um, water center. And 
yeah, let's explore gaming as well, esports and gaming. And you know what I didn't see coming? I, I knew it would work. I knew there's some synergies with Crypto Center and, and it would work in DMCC. But I didn't see my, my team acing every time we put uh, the imaging, marketing material, messaging, because I usually change stuff, whether it's for the oil and gas, diamonds and gold. To give you an example how, uh, uh, it, it, what's the word, uh, disagreeable I am. We have a diamond uh, corporate video. We have a DMCC corporate video. We have multiple future of trade videos with the reports, snippets, and all the simple coffee center, um, one tea center. We do not have a gold one. And that's the first thing we started with DMCC. Why? I reject all the videos. They're too tacky for me. I'm going to give it one more try. So I'm, I'm just, but the gaming one, every time it comes in, I'm like, yeah, awesome. Are, are these guys gaming addicts? I just want to go and meet them. And it's the computer graphics people. They love it. And uh, one thing led to the other. And we have over 100 companies. I am targeting Gala Games. I'm looking at others as well. But also we have hackathons. We had a, we had a day for coders. Remember that? And last yeah. hour, they were just making games right then and there. And it was during the weekend. And you'd see me and Master are walking, thanking them as well. Um, I, it grieves me when I'm traveling and there's a big setup for DMCC's gaming center at Expo during that uh, gaming event. Esports, I couldn't make it. I had, I had to be somewhere else. I had the biggest FOMO, but they all contacted me. The, the big, some of the uh, Yalla Sports, um, La Liga that was already in DMCC is working to get involved on the esports side. So it, it is working and I'm having fun, but also from a selfish part, I get to tell my mother all of these sleepless nights, the hours I wasted and didn't go to school, well, now it's paying off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just a fun fact there, I covered for you on that uh, expo thing. I did a keynote speech. <laughs> so don't worry. Um, speaking of that, actually, uh, so esports, um, it's going to take off in a big way in this region because we have a gaming culture already, just like you foresaw that there was a coffee culture coming up. There is a huge gaming culture coming up here with the kids. All my kids play video games. Uh, the only thing that's stopping them is us as parents. But we're, good luck. <laughs> yeah. When they get out of my house, they go to their cousin's house. Guess what they're doing? They're playing video games. So no matter how much you try to put the brakes on gaming, this is how they are digitally native. They are digitally you know, entertaining themselves. Uh, the consumption that they're doing, they're not, it's not from books. It's from audio books. It's from YouTube videos. It's from everything digital. And the entertainment, they are native to it. They, this is their life. This is how they get entertained. They play football. They do martial arts. They do chess. But this is only secondary to their number one thing they go to is always video games. I think you just wrapped up this whole um, beginning of the conversation. Started with creativity as a catalyst for growth, and that is creative. Essentially, is we've creatively evolved the way we learn, right, um, through technology. Right? And so that had been fueled creativity further, and I hope to see more creativity, um, uh, this creative knowledge transfer happen, there's more collaborations here um, to learn from each other to, to better um, uh, unite our, our causes. Well, before we conclude, I'd like to hear <laughs> you share your plans for the Garibay Institute for the region. Yeah, we, we, we saw a huge opportunity here um, as an institute. Essentially, here we have um, the best producers, songwriters, um, film directors, uh, movie makers, and uh, they, they can't survive off the traditional economic models that exist in the US, right? Can't raise any more capital for film the way you used to. So yes, AI will make it cheaper, but you still need the creative talent. You still need to survive, right? You need to seed that. So we partnered with Angel Studio. That's one of the big studios right now. Most controversial, but talked about studio because they're doing actually great films that amplify and bring people together, right? And so we want to see if we can bring this project here. And that's one. But second, I think the most important is the knowledge transfer opportunity, right? So we have these um, creative class and uh, experts, and they are not getting paid in the West, right? Because there's no intersect between the, their commodity sale, right, and uh, receiving return for that commodity sale. But there's an opportunity to teach and, not, and collaborate. Right? And so if we're looking to fuel the next generation uh, in the MENA region, and by way of Dubai perhaps, uh, then there might be a really strong opportunity to co collaborate and co-create together to fuel the education process. Because this is one thing we have discovered as an institute, is you learn by doing, but doing with experts. 
But the problem is, we never in history had the opportunity to have experts that need the economic opportunity as well. And I guarantee you, when you have like people like uh, DJ Alok, Afrojack come here, and instead of just asking them to DJ, ask them to mentor too, they're gonna say yes, because they love to teach. Beautiful. I hope we will be working a lot more together. I'm looking forward to it. Before. Thank you for another episode Thank of Dubai having... TV. Stay tuned for The Simpsons. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.